Hi there, welcome to part one of what I'm planning to be a series of videos focusing on GIS, Geographical Information Systems, specifically for geography teachers. And this is something I've been meaning to do for a little while. So as a university lecturer who teaches a lot of GIS classes, I've kind of picked up that GIS um, before degree level can be pretty patchy. And I think that's possibly linked to, to two things. One of those is probably concerns about the resources you need. And one of the things I'll hopefully do over the, the course of these videos is demonstrate that actually you don't need too much in the, the way of resources. If you've got basic computers um, or even just access to a browser, then actually there's tools available that will allow you to, to introduce at least the basics of, of GIS. And the second is confidence. So I've had several geography teachers reach out to me in the past um, and ask for, for kind of support getting to grips with GIS. And again, to me, GIS, I can, it obviously can seem quite daunting, um, but I believe that with a fairly kind of basic and quick introduction, it's actually quite easy to, to get to grips with. And there's some really sophisticated, complex analysis that brings out some interesting results that we can actually do in just a, a few clicks once you've got to grips with the basics of the, the kind of data sets that you're working with and the fundamentals of, of the tools that, that you're using. So that's really my aim is to demonstrate that it's not difficult to, to kind of get to grips with the basics of GIS and hopefully start to share that with your students and allow them to um, you know, play around, experiment and learn using some really exciting tools. So, starting at the beginning, what is GIS? So, hopefully if you're here, you've probably come across the acronym before. Um, and actually, the acronym GIS can be used in a couple of different ways. So, the most common, and actually the one that I'm going to be referring to here, is Geographical Information Systems. And this kind of focuses on using software tools to look at, analyse, visualise, geospatial data. Um, so it's kind of focused on that, that kind of computing side of things. Uh, the other term you might come across is geographical information science. And essentially, the way I always explain it is that geographical information science is the kind of broader field focusing on issues around data quality, data types, the kind of different types of analysis that we can use for, for spatial data, understanding how and why they work. So we need to have some basic understanding of geographical information science to, to use GIS, but actually most of that understanding is things that as geography teachers you will already have, and the little bits you need in terms of understanding data sets, hopefully I will give to you over the course of these videos. So it's geographical information systems that we're going to focus on um, in this, this video series. So what makes GIS special? So information systems are something that we use all the time. And probably the most common example is Excel spreadsheets. You know, Excel spreadsheets are an information system. They allow us to input data into cells in various different types, whether that's text, whether it's numeric, even images. Um, they allow us to, to sort that data, to analyze it, and to visualize it, to produce graphs and tables so that we can more effectively understand that data. And GIS, in many ways, um, is the same. Actually, the kind of tables that we work with in Excel could be our starting point for working in geographical information systems. Obviously, what makes GIS unique is that it has the focus on the spatial aspect of the data. So rather than just looking at differences between groups, for example, that we've already determined, um, or changes over time, it allows us to do all of those things, but to look at that spatially and look at how, how are things happening differently in different areas? How do two sets of data relate to each other in a, a spatial way? Which points are falling within which areas? What can we find within this distance of a particular object or, or feature? Uh, so it allows us to map the data, to find relationships and to analyze spatial patterns in the the data sets and obviously for us as geographers 
that's hugely valuable because pretty much everything we're looking at is going to have some kind of spatial component linked to it. And as I said, most GIS can work with Excel tables as well. Actually, if we've got spatial information within that table, and again, the chances are we may well have something that will allow us to link that data to a location, then actually we can already potentially map that data and go beyond our, our kind of graphs and stats and start looking at the spatial patterns that, that it contains. And there are many ways that we can actually add or already have a spatial component to our data. Um, and there may well be others that I've not listed here, but essentially any kind of location data can be used to map it. Um, in GIS, ultimately what we want are effectively GPS coordinates or map coordinates, sort of numeric values that will allow us to calculate a position for our data. And some data sets might have that already if we've been out in the field with say, a handheld GPS or a phone app and collected that data. But many other data sets might have addresses, city names, postcode, um, landmarks, map grid references, or even just a country name. You know, if we're mapping things on a global scale, just knowing the country that data is connected to can be enough to map it out and start to look at global patterns. You know, things like, for example, coronavirus case data. You know, we might want to look at something like that on a, a global scale and just having a country name is enough for us to start to, to map out and connect that data. So although we want to have ultimately coordinates to be able to map data in GIS, um, there's a technique called geocoding, um, and that's the technical term for adding coordinates based on other location information. And this is essentially what something like Google Maps does. If you were to type your home address in Google Maps, um, hit enter, it will drop a pin on the map. And what it's actually done is geocode that address data. So it's taken your address, essentially looked it up against a database and calculated or pulled out from that database the GPS coordinates that um, are linked to, to your address. And there are tools out there that will allow us to do this with our own data. So we can take any of these kind of pieces of spatial information and use it to map data that we might have already collected or found from a variety of different sources. And that allows us to answer a whole range of different questions. And really, if you can think of a question that relates to where something is or how locations relate or what's happening in different areas, then we can use GIS to answer it. So this is just a, a handful of, of possibilities. So where are crime hotspots near me? If we can download crime data, which is freely available from the police. Um, and this is probably one of the exercises that I'm going to show in a couple of videos time then we can actually start to look at the hotspots. Where, where is crime happening? Where have we got lower crime levels? Do different types of crime tend to occur in different places? And can we identify why those different patterns are occurring? We can look at travel times. And again, there's free tools that will allow us to do this. And we can start to ask questions like, where is more than 15 minutes from a hospital? You know, where are people potentially at risk because there are gaps in important services? Or where are people lacking access to green spaces, for example, which is quite a, a relevant topic at the moment with us being on lockdown. If you can't drive to, to walk, do you have a park nearby that you can use? Or are there people who are kind of stuck, unable to do that? How tall are buildings? We can use elevation data. And again, there's freely available data sets that will allow us to, to do this, to calculate the heights of different buildings um, or the heights of trees or other natural features. And we can start to look at vegetation using, again, freely available satellite imagery. We can calculate quite easily with a few clicks in GIS indices that will say, where is vegetation nice and green and healthy? And where do we have bare ground or unhealthy vegetation? And why might that be? And one of the brilliant things about GIS, um, in my opinion, is the fact that it's very much a cross-disciplinary tool. You know, whether we're interested in human issues you know, crime, deprivation, um, you know, things like the access to schools, access to hospitals, access to green space, or whether we're interested in the physical environment, you know, plant health or coastal erosion, where are areas at risk of flooding? Can we identify glacial landforms? 
All of those kind of questions are things that we can answer with with GIS. And again, particularly at the moment, recording this you know, during the, the coronavirus lockdown, when things like opportunities for fieldwork might be limited, having the ability to pull in this kind of data and visit areas virtually and carry out analysis um, is, is, you know, a hugely valuable tool. And in my admittedly limited experience um, of, of kind of working with high school students carrying out GIS exercises, you know, the ability to do these kind of things has, has really seemed to kind of engage them with the, the topics and particularly when they realise the kind of power of the analysis that they can carry out with, with GIS tools. And obviously there's many more questions that we could, could answer as well. Where's the best site for a solar farm? Um, so site suitability assessment is something that's widely carried out um, by a whole range of, of kind of businesses in the real world and something that we can demonstrate on a basic level really easily with GIS tools. Am I in a flood prone area? You know, how far are we from a river? How high is the ground where we're looking? How could we plan for a forest fire? Where are there areas at risk? Where could we get to within 15 minutes that puts us outside of the, the risk zone? Um, how do social factors in different areas influence how people vote? So this is maybe a slightly more advanced question, but can we look in different areas at how people voted in the last election? And what are the, the demographics of those areas? Can we start to see patterns coming out? Do richer areas vote differently from poorer areas, for example? So so many different things that we can start to, to investigate with, with these tools. And a lot of the time we can make this analysis as simple or as complex as we want to. So it doesn't need to be a kind of daunting, scary thing to get into. With just a couple of different layers, we can start to understand some of the processes that are going on and answer some of these questions. So that was very quick, but the aim of these videos really is to you know, I'm aware that people are very busy. You've only got a limited amount of, of time and resources yourselves. And I want to make this as, as kind of quick and accessible as possible. So hopefully in a relatively few minutes, that's giving you an understanding of broadly what GIS is, how it differs from other information systems, and some of the questions that we can start to, to think about trying to answer using GIS. So my plan from here is in the second video to look a bit at some of the different types of data that we would work with in GIS. So getting a bit more into the, the kind of technical details and looking at raster data sets, vector data sets and tables, which might sound complex if you've not come across them before, but don't worry, it's, it's really quite simple once you realise the difference. And after that, in part three, my aim is to kind of dive straight into some of the, the practical aspects. So giving some exercises that you can get started with using both um, QGIS, which is a free and open source desktop GIS package. So you do have to download it and install it on your computer, but it's completely free for anybody to download and use. And actually, you don't need a powerful computer. If you want to look at a massive data set, OK, maybe you will. But if you just want to get started with simple data sets, then you don't need a high end PC to to be using GIS software. And I'll also try to look at some similar exercises using ArcGIS Online, which is a browser based platform. Um, and if you've not come across it before, then it's freely available for schools. So it's made by a company called Esri, who make a, another package called ArcGIS. Um, and they have a, a schools program. So if you've never come across it, I'll show you where you can go online and register for it and show you some of the, the basics of, of using ArcGIS online and, and some exercises that you could try out with, with your students. Um, and I'm completely open to requests and questions, so if there's anything else you want to know, or if you think it would be really useful to have an exercise on a certain topic, feel free to, to kind of post a comment, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to kind of help you out um, and accommodate any requests. So I hope you found that useful. Um, if you did, please do like and subscribe because that helps to, to support me and um, keep your eyes peeled for part two. Thanks.